All right, so please uh, give an applause to David Saidrin. He's going to present hard fault debugging for PX4. Well, I, I want to say thank you to everybody that's here in this room because I realize how much we all depend on each other and, and how we further this project, and it is really wonderful to see everybody here. Um, my background is that um, I, I'm the owner of a company called NSCDG, and um, I've been in doing embedded systems for 30, 35 plus years. And um, I got involved in PX4 during, um, I guess it was the end of 2015, um, when um, uh, Lorenz reached out to me and he said that he needed somebody to help with NUTX integration. I think I just finished loading the last thing. And um, what, what he was looking for was bringing PX4 up to using current NUTX. It was about two years in the arrears of where upstream NUTX was at the time. And I, I got involved in the project and I started learning. I knew nothing about drones. I knew nothing about flying. Um, there's a joke that you know, all that I have is on my desk is, is the hardware. I don't have propellers. I don't have full systems. But I work with typical manufacturers bringing up their initial hardware and porting PX4 to, to different processors. And um, one of the ideas that Lorenz had was that he wanted to make sure that if anything happened in the air, we had the ability to log it. And if there was a processor fault or a bug in a driver or a bug in the OS, we wanted to know where exactly that occurred and how to track it down. And he came up with a really a, a genius idea, which was if we could store this information after the crash in the non-volatile memory of the processor, we'd have the ability to get that information after boot when things were sane again in the environment. So um, that was the, the birth of hard fault logging. Now, does, does everybody know what hard fault logging in PX4 is? Show my hands. OK. So Julian went through something, and he was showing you val grind and call grind and, and you know, how to find bugs in GDB. If they get past that point and they make it onto the hardware, we have a probability of a few different situations that can occur. One of them is actually executing an invalid instruction because we've vectored through a table that got corrupted in memory. Another possibility is dereferencing a pointer that's pointing to null, which happens to be address zero, and a processor detects that and faults. That type of fault is called a hard fault. There are many different types of faults that you can get. Uh, let's see, I gotta get a mouse over there. <laughs> there we go. So, so in NUTX, there are the design of NUTX for its interrupt handling and its ex uh, exception handling is very portable across many different platforms, and it's generic in a lot of ways. And to accommodate that, every type of interrupt goes through a common vector table, and we end up into a service that we're supposed to run. If it's hardware interrupt, we enter into the UART. Let's say it's a UART that receives a character. There's an interrupt that's generated. We go through this vector table. We end up in the UART. Uh, ISR, we process the data there, we return from the internet, things are going well. But if you're in a situation where you've executed bad code because you vectored off what we used to call into the weeds, you will end up in a hard fault situation. The processor will execute an instruction that's invalid for the execution context that it's in. And these can fall into different classes. There's hard faults, which are like an invalid instruction. There's a memory manager fault where you've accessed an area in memory you shouldn't be accessing. There are bus faults. For instance, you have a peripheral that hasn't been enabled and you go to access a register in it. Um, and you have usage faults, which is <laughs> a little bit more complicated. It's a context that you're running in that you try to do something that isn't valid for that usage. And you, but through NUTX, we all end up in the same place, which is called UPAssert. Now, 
depending on the architecture of the processor, we're usually on ARM cores, but there are many different types of, of processors that we run on, you have a normal mechanism of, of um, exception handling. And what that looks like is, is this. When there's an exception or an interrupt, the processor leaves the thread of execution that it's running in, and it vectors through this table. To do that, it has to save context on a stack so that it can return from what just happened back to where it was running. And you could look at that, and you could spend time decoding the offsets and the addresses to find the registers that it saved on the stack. One of those registers is the address of the thing that caused the fault. But you'd have to spend a lot of time understanding the processor, understanding the architecture of this processor, understanding how it's stacked. And what I wanted to point out to people is it's a lot simpler to do a couple of tricks. And the trick is based on the fact that we always end up in, in UP assert. So let, let me go through it here a little bit. So both hardware and software can cause a fault. You could have the example of a part that hasn't been initialized, an IP block that hasn't been turned on that you access, you will fault. You can have an issue where you have an interrupt that was running and an interrupt priority that was set higher than it, that interrupts, interrupts this, and you have nested interrupts which isn't supported in NUTX, you will fault. So what does this look like? Typically, you're, you're sitting, well actually, let me ask another question. How many people here run PX4 with a developer's console connected? Okay. Is that on the serial console or is that through Mavlink? Serial, okay. So, so how many people actually have a hardwired serial connected to their hardware? Okay, that's good. So what this looks like on the console is you're running code, things are working. You might start seeing what Julian was showing where there's a stall, and then all of a sudden you get this dump of registers on the screen and the machine reboots. That's a hard fault. That's what it looks like to, to you. Um, let me get back here. There's, there's, different, there's different levels of complication when you have a hard fault, and the debugging is equally broken into two categories, the easy-to-find ones and the hard-to-find ones. I was talking to somebody the other night, and I said the easy-to-find ones are, you know, four hours, two hours maybe. It's pretty simple to, to figure out what causes it. The hard ones start to get to one to two days. When you're into a week of debugging, in a hardware debugger, you know you've had a really hard problem, right? So we'll start with the simple ones and we'll talk about why they're simple. They're repeatable. Every time you run the code, it crashes, always crashes in the same place. You can almost debug this from looking at the console output. But there's, another, there's an easier way. Um, so I, I gave you the example of executing a pure virtual function. So does everybody know what a pure virtual function is in C++? Does everybody know what that looks like in assembler? Okay, so what that boils down to is it boils down to, um, it, it can be a call to something that will execute an invalid instruction so that you get a fault, or it will call exit and give you a reference to where the, the pure virtual is invoked. But ultimately what it is, is it is a, uh, and it's kind of syntactically indicated that way in C++ that it's set equal to zero. If you're running on real hardware and it doesn't have exception handling in C++, that's going to end up executing at address zero, which is a hard fault. So those are easy to find. Um, if, you, if you look at it from the more complex point of view, you have a task that's running here, and it's allocated a buffer, but it miscalculated its, its address references to that buffer, and it's writing down here in somebody else's stack space. Well, that process may get suspended, and while it's suspended and it's sitting out waiting to run again, its stack got overwritten, and on its stack was a this pointer to uh, an object that it's going to manipulate. When it comes back, you now have junk or zero in that address. When you dereference that pointer, you will also crash. So 
what happens is every one of these things leads to the same place in the execution path, and they give you the same results on the screen. You have to ferret out what the cause is. So the way we, we, way we do this with the hardware is we started with, um, when I started working on the drones, I would get different boards from different manufacturers with many different connectors on them. And I had this, this board on the, on the um, left main that um, I wired up, and I would hang this off of the drone, and I would hang a JTAG debugger off of it, and I would run the code, and I'd download it, and I, that was my development environment. The problem with it is that it was very unstable. It was handmade, and when you're debugging a problem, you want to, it's, it's like the same situation where you start out, you've got a brand new piece of hardware and brand new software, and you're trying to integrate them. You don't know where the problem is. Well, you don't want the problem to be your tools. So we decided that what we would do is we would make up a debug board that would allow us to integrate with PX4's platforms and be rock solid. And one of the things we found over time was that the old way that we used to debug, if you have, remember version 2.4.6, you had two connectors on it, one of them that went to the debugger, one of them that went to the console. The console was connected to an FTDI cable. If you plugged in the FTDI cable and then you brought the system up, there was a voltage that was back feeding into the board and it would raise the voltage high enough on the SD card that it would brown it out. So you'd boot and you'd get an error that your SD card wasn't mounted. So how many people remember popping the card out and plugging it back in and, cycle, and, and then popping the card in and, and recycling the power and having to do that to get their SD card to work again? Is there a Show of hands, okay, it's happened. So, so one of the features that we added to the board was isolation to allow uh, no, no uh, backfeeding of voltages from the debugging environment back into the target. And over time, we had two connectors on there. We, have, um, we, we now have uh, quite a few connectors on there because of, of different hardware platforms. The first connector on the board, that's the, the board closest to me, is the, um, the interface to the uh, V2.1 hardware. And it's a really fine cable. The next connector that's on there is for all the targets that support the drone code six pin connector. But prior to that, there were some par parts that were fabricated, boards that were fabricated, not realizing what the specification for the connector was. So we'd receive boards that had the next connector on it. And then finally, um, NXP Flight uses an 8-pin connector with a reset signal, which is one of the recommendations on the drone code site. And when we, if we look at the last connector that's on there, that's the new um, V5X debug connector that's defined. And it adds some features. Oops. <laughs> it adds some features where we have actually hardware trace that I think Scott had mentioned so that we can do full code coverage and profiling in hardware. So without any other delay, let's talk about what it takes to debug. Um, when I started, which was a long time ago, in this industry, it took a desktop full of equipment to do what we can do with a $20 part nowadays. It, you'd have to go in and you'd have to tell your boss, I need a budget of $15,000 to buy this piece of equipment so that we can find this really hard problem we're having that there's no other way to solve it. And you, you ended up with this huge system. You, you had to bring it up. They had a, one of the best features about it was there was this thing called a, um, a hardware verification. So you would plug in, you'd plug in the ICE. It was actually called an ICE back then. And a lot of people, when I'm talking to them about JTAG, I, I call them ICEs because it's what I remember, which stands for in-circuit emulator. The reason they were so expensive is they had to produce special silicon with the bond out to be able to get to the internals of the processor to be able to do what we do with the $20 part. So the, the, the barrier to being able to do hardware debugging has dropped significantly. Every one of the PX4 PixHawk platforms supports hardware debugging and a hard console on it. And I would, if you're, if you're seriously developing and you want to get to the root cause of problems, the fastest way to do that is through the hardware console and with the JTAG debugger. 
So let's look at this. So what I'm going to demo here is the... Um, let me close this. Where is it? No. Uh, did my VM hang or is this just in front of it? Let me come around this side. There we go. Um, how many of are you are familiar with the ARM MCU Eclipse plugin? Okay, that's good. Yeah. So to me, um, this, this is where I started to say at the beginning I, I was kind of taking issue with it's hard to debug on hardware because in, in this environment, you're debug debugging on hardware and it looks just like you're running GDB on the, in the simulation. It's going to be a little bit trickier because of funny. I need to get a console over here. So when the hard fault debug, uh, hard fault logging was built, part of it was a command to test it. And I'm going to go ahead and issue a hard fault so you can see what it looks like in case you're not familiar with it. I'm not sure you can hear the system from back there, but let me look. Can everybody see this? <coughs> this, the, um, this is the actual processor register dump that occurred because we hit a bad address. And there's context here from NUTX. What's here is, is also the task list that was running and the depth of each one of the stacks that has, has been used in each one of the tasks. So for every, every one of the tasks that's running, it, it'll give you an idea of whether or not you've exceeded your, your stack space and overwritten the process below it. So that's one thing that's worthwhile looking at at this point. But there's a lot of information here. Okay, There's a lot of information here, and it's kind of hard to interpret it. But what's really simple to do is come in here and set a breakpoint. on UP hard fault. Now, earlier I was talking about how complicated the different architectures are and what the stack looks like and figuring out how to unwind it. And this is the trick that I'd like to share with you. It's not easy. With I can't split the screen, so I have to be jumping back and forth. I'm sorry. OK. We're, we're in the debugger. We've stopped. We're at the hard fault handler. We want to know. How did we get here? So you've got, a, you've got a, a build. The build runs. It runs for maybe an hour, and then it crashes. All you do is you set up the JTAG. You place the breakpoint on the hard fault handler. And this is, this is where the magic comes in. You go to the registers, and you have to understand a little bit about the, the processor and the architecture. But basically, the link register 
is used to return to the previous frame when you're returning from a call. So what we do is we grab the link register, and we drop that back into the PC. We switch ourselves into instruction stepping mode, and we step. If I can see which thing it is here. Yeah. Okay, so we're stepping assembly code and C plus or C code at the same time. The reason we're stepping it in in instruction mode is because it's uninterruptible. So we're already in an interrupt, so we're probably not worried about really taking another one. But what we're doing is we're stepping through the handler. And you'll notice that, oh, let me get back to here. That instruction was the return. We just returned to the code that actually caused the hard fault. And in this case, it's due to an undefined instruction. The undefined instruction, when you look at it, is because the compiler is smart. It knew that I was trying to take one and divide it by zero. And instead of putting that floating point math in there and creating all the code that was needed for it, it replaced it with an un undefined instruction. So it's, it's this simple, is, is to place the breakpoint in hard fault and step back in instruction mode until you exit the interrupt handler and you're at the line of code where your problem is in your code. <coughs> And that should save a huge amount of time in debugging a, a, a serious hard fault. It will take you right to the, to the source line of code where the problem exists. Thank you, David.